Maharaj Pariksit said, one may know that sinful activity is injurious for him because he actually sees <laughs> that a criminal is punished by the government and rebuked by people in general and because he hears from scriptures and learned scholars that one is thrown into hellish conditions in the next life for committing sinful acts. Nevertheless, in spite of such knowledge, one is forced to commit sins again and again, even after performing acts of atonement. Therefore, what is the value of such atonement? Purpose. In some religious sects, a sinful man goes to a priest to confess his sinful acts and pays a fine. But then he again commits the same sins and returns to confess them again. This is the practice of a professional sinner. Pariksit Maharaj's observations indicate that even 5,000 years ago it was the practice of criminals to atone for their crimes, but then commit the same crimes again as if forced to do so. Therefore, owing to his practical experience, Pariksit Maharaj saw that the process of repeatedly sinning and atoning is pointless. Regardless of how many times he is punished, one who is attached to sense enjoyment will commit sinful acts again and again until he is trained to refrain from enjoying his senses. The word vivasha is used herein, indicating that even one who does not want to commit sinful acts will be forced to do so by habit. Pariksit Maharaj therefore considered the process of atonement to have little value for saving one from sinful acts. In the following verse, he fully, further explains his rejection of this process, <clears throat> which I'll read also. Kvachin nivatate badrat kvachit charati tat puna prayaschitam atopatam manye kunjara shauchavat. Sometimes one who is very alert so as not to commit sinful acts is victimized by sinful life again. I therefore consider this process of repeated sinning and atoning to be useless. It is like the bathing of an elephant, for an elephant cleanses itself by taking a full bath, but then throws dust over its head and body as soon as it returns to the land. <clears throat> the verses again. Shri Raja Vacha, Tishta Shutabhyam Yathapam Janam Apyatmanohitam Kuroti Bhuyo Vivasha Prayaschittam Matokatam Maharaj Pariksit said, One may know that sinful activity is injurious for him because he actually sees that a criminal is punished by the government and rebuked by people in general and because he hears from scriptures and learned scholars that one is thrown into hellish conditions in the next life for committing sinful acts. Nevertheless, in spite of such knowledge, one is forced to commit sins again and again, even after performing acts of atonement. Therefore, what is the value of such atonement? Sometimes one who is very alert, so as not to commit sinful acts, is victimized by sinful life again. I therefore consider this process of repeated sinning and atoning to be useless. It is like the bathing of an elephant, for an elephant cleanses itself by taking a full bath, but then throws dust over its head and body as soon as it returns to the land. <laughs> so these verses fully condemn the process of committing sinful activities and atoning for them. As Prabhupada says, it is the practice of a professional sinner. Someone whose sinful activities are his profession. It is his daily fare. He commits sinful acts, confesses for it. And they go to the church and they say, Forgive me, Father, I have sinned. It has been so many days since I last confessed. And these are my sins. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Ad infinitum. Please forgive me all these sins. And the Father says, Okay, you do these prayers, A, B, C, and you give such and such money in the box. 
And then he goes out again and he commits sinful activities. No sooner does he leave and he remembers them all so the next week he can go and say, I've done this and that and that and he pays some money in the box. In this way, he's paying for his sinful activities. It is actually pretty cheap. You don't have to pay too much. And therefore, sinful activities, you can go on performing, and you only have to pay a little bit for them. And you get a lot of enjoyment out of them. <laughs> so, you can pay, pay for these sins. <laughs> but in Krishna consciousness, you can't pay for the sins with some money. You have to pay with a lot of suffering. <laughs> that is the problem. People think just by paying some money, they will be freed from their sinful activity. But it doesn't work like that. Right. Here the example is given of the criminal. A criminal knows that his criminal activities are going to cause him punishment. He knows it. He's seen it. Other criminals, they've been caught by the police. They've been thrown in jail. People in general rebuke him. They say nasty things about him. The newspapers write nasty things about him. He doesn't get ahead very far in the world. He always remains a criminal. And he knows from the scripture, he's heard from learned scholars, that he shouldn't commit these activities, but still he does it again and again. Why? Because of uncontrollable senses. Uncontrolled. A person who is called a dantago or who has uncontrollable senses, they're in no way controllable. A dantago here, Vishitak Tamishram, he falls down into Tamishram. We described, we read some of the hells. Tamishra is one of the hells. Under Tamishra, another hell. Kumbhipaka. Uh, there's so many houses. here. Tamishram. It also means into the darkness of ignorance. So, a person who uh, is uncontrolled senses, he falls down into this hellish condition of life. He cannot become Krishna conscious either by his own endeavor, neither with another person, and neither in a group assembly. Krishna consciousness does not manifest, it doesn't matter who he's with, because he's got too many sense desires. Therefore, somebody who's full of sense desires and always trying to enjoy his senses in this way, even if he comes to Krishna consciousness, he won't be purified. Sometimes they even criticize the Krishna conscious process. Well, here I am, a first class rascal, but Krishna consciousness is not purifying me, therefore it's no good. But, Srimad Bhagavatam, is Prahlad Maharaj speaking. He said, even if you're alone, if you're with someone else, or you're in a group assembly, if you are simply a tanta go, then there's no question of becoming Krishna conscious. Because one is always chewing that which has already been chewed so many times before. This is a foolishness. Chewing and chewing this material sense enjoyment trying to enjoy it over and over again, but never getting the real satisfaction. But because of habit, one goes on chewing. It is described as habit. Habit is so powerful that it forces one to commit sinful activities even when he doesn't want to. In this world, we are filled with habits. We develop habits. These habits are developed over long, long period of time through so many thousands of species of life. All of the species have the same habits, eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. And because of these habits, when we come to the human form, and in the human form, previous human forms, we have these habits developing. And in this present lifetime, we develop habits. And because of these habits, having a sinful nature, when one is not enlightened by Krishna consciousness or growing up in a Gurukul, for example, because of having these sinful habits, they're very powerful 
And they cause one to again and again commit sinful activities because it is his nature to commit sinful activities. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains this in another way. He explains, Kama Esha Kodesha Rajaguna Samudbala. That the sinful activities which are causing one to act sinfully, even by force, this is due to lust alone. Due to the influence of lust, a living entity is forced to act sinfully, even though he doesn't want. Maharaj Vishabdev spoke of this in another way. He called it Nunam Pramatta Kuru He said, it is just like madness. And Shukadev Goswami said, Tesham Pramatta Nidanam. Uh, simply mad without any knowledge. In this way, the whole material world is characterized. A place full of madmen. It is a madhouse. An insane asylum where all crazy peoples of this world are locked up and told you stay here and you keep on rotating in this material world through cycles of birth and death until you're sick of it, you fool. Go on, do it more and more. Enjoy yourself. It doesn't work, but just go on. Keep trying to enjoy. One day you may surrender. So just keep suffering. It's an unfortunate situation. Not very pleasant. But because we are so much accustomed, so much addicted to sense gratification, then the only solution is to just get the head cracked again and again and again and again until finally it is just sand. The rock head when pulverized becomes sand. So, Krishna Ganges person, he's in a different category than such a person who is habituated to sinful activities. Because a Krishna conscious man learns another kind of habit. Sometimes people say, oh, what is the use of changing your dress? What is the use of doing these things you do? But actually, if we didn't do it, then we would maintain the same habits as formerly. A man who is living in a circumstance which is of his previous activity will regain the activities or his habits from former times. In Krishna consciousness, we break completely this acclimation to our previous lifestyle by taking a totally new lifestyle in order that we can break our previous habits. Therefore, if people, they foolishly think they can go on living just like they were always living and become Krishna conscious somehow or another. That is why, as soon as the church modernized everything and made everything very secular looking, then all of the so-called priests, they became just like ordinary people in every respect, doing everything everybody else did. Because there's no change of habit. Keeping the habit the same means the same lustful activities will manifest living with karmis, eating karmi food, looking like a karmi, uh, making money like a karmi, and spending it like a karmi. This is the way in which to remain a karmi. Karmi means a materialist, somebody who is getting karma, somebody who is building up his karma. He's a karmi. Just like one who's performing yoga, he's a yogi. So the karmis are those who are just building up their karma unlimitedly because of their associations, their actions, their consciousness. But a devotee changes his association. He doesn't associate with karmis, he associates with devotees. He changes what he eats. He doesn't eat the karmi food, even if it's very healthy. He eats prashada. He changes his dress. He doesn't look like a materialist. He looks like a devotee. He changes his habits. He's not unrestrictedly doing whatever he wants whenever he wants to do it. He accepts regulation for a higher purpose. In this way, the habit of a devotee is broken and hopefully his sinful inclination 
that comes by habit will also be broken because the breeding ground for such sinful activities no longer exists. Just like living in a city is a perfect example of a breeding ground for sinful activities always associating with lusty materialists, therefore you become also overwhelmed. But if one lives in a temple, he doesn't become overwhelmed like that because there's no possibility for such activities here, or limited possibility. So therefore one is protected by the environment. Whereas in a normal city life, one is not protected. One is destroyed by the environment. So therefore Krishna consciousness affords one a chance to change his life for the better. Therefore, we insist that one who wants to be a devotee must change his lifestyle. You cannot maintain your lifestyle and expect to become a devotee. It is very, very, very difficult unless one is rather specially situated. One must change his lifestyle in order to be known as a devotee. Otherwise, one will maintain his material attachments and will go on sinning Go on overwhelmed, becoming overwhelmed by lusty activities. Go on being a criminal. And what is the use? One is it becomes a criminal, then he atones. We see this all the time. You go to jail, sit in the jail, come out, and while in jail, one is plotting how to do it better and not get caught the next time. And then he comes out and again performs criminal activity, and then it's caught and thrown back in jail. And again he's thinking, next time I won't get caught. And it becomes just a habit. What else can he do? He says, my life is already ruined. I may as well just keep on doing this and make the best of a bad body. That is the idea of the material. So, uh, what is the use of such atonement? There's no use. There's no use to throw people in jail like that, constantly, again and again and again. Therefore, in the Vedic system, the atonement was quite severe. This way, you don't do it again. So, what is the use of such atonement for sinful activities? You go and you confess your sin. You go, you atone. There are different kinds of atonement. Uh, some kinds of atonement. They're all given in the Manusmriti, Dharma Shastras. As explained yesterday, there are many different kinds of Dharma Shastras like the Manusamhita and others. Wherein a certain kind of sinful activity is described and a certain kind of atonement is also prescribed. Prescribed. So for example, if you've done something, uh, then you have to do this. Or you can, if you can't do that, then do this. That is given there. We don't remember any of these principles offhand. There are so many of them. They're not valuable. They have no value to the devotees. Uh, but to know that the Dharma Shastras are there, that's interesting. Uh, but one who performs these sinful activities, even if he atones, will just do it again. What is that? Prikshit Maharaj says, Manye Kunjur Sochava. It's just like the bathing of an elephant. An elephant always goes into the lake. This is his habit. And then he's wading in the lake halfway and takes his, his, his nose, his trunk, fills it with water, sprays water all over himself for a long time and gets very, very clean. Elephants get very clean this way. Then they go onto the land. And then as soon as they're on the land, they think, this cleanliness is no good. So they take dirt in their nose and blow it all over themselves to finish their bath. Just like people put powder, <laughs> the elephant puts dirt. Same thing. So, uh, this elephant, he's clean, then he makes himself dirty. So therefore, this repeated sinful activity and atonement and sinful activity, this is like the bathing of an elephant. This complete brainless activity. Work hard to get oneself clean, then throw dirt on. Consciously throwing dirt on. This is not very good. Therefore, one who wants to be Krishna conscious, this is, should not be doing such things. 
But here it said, even if he's very alert as to not commit sinful activities, still he will do it anyway. Therefore, there's no use to this atonement whatsoever. It is material. And Parikshit Maharaj is rejecting it. Now someone may say, how is it that Parikshit Maharaj is rejecting that which his spiritual master said? Uh, the answer is that it was a test from Sukadev Goswami. He purposely said something which was not correct, just to see how alert his disciple was. <laughs> I have seen, I've personally never, I did it maybe once here, but Adi Keshe Maharaj once in Boston gave a lecture, and in the middle of the lecture he started preaching Mayavadi philosophy. State Mayavadi philosophy in different ways. And all of the devotees just sat there, went on listening. Nobody said anything. So in the end he said, are there any questions? No one had any questions. Then he yelled at them, you fools, I've been preaching Mayavadi philosophy for the last half hour, you haven't said a word. <laughs> so sometimes there's tests given to see if you're alert. Sometimes the spiritual master will say something just to see how you react. He'll say something even sometimes that's just completely crazy. Just to see where, where you're at. How you will react. <clears throat> An intelligent disciple, he will immediately, he will immediately say, excuse me, but I cannot understand that at all. Can you please explain? And then spiritual master will explain if the disciple is not intelligent enough to understand. Friction Mars is super intelligent disciple. He said, I can understand what you're saying, but I see practically that it doesn't work. So then he's waiting for Shukadeva Goswami to say something more. Shukadeva Goswami then, in the next verse, he will go to the next higher platform, but still he will not come to the perfect platform. This also we saw this kind of question and answering and gradually attaining higher states of awareness with Ramananda Roy and Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya would ask a question and Ramananda Roy would answer at the lowest level. Then Lord Chaitanya would say, ah, go further, that is not high enough. And Lord, Ramananda Roy would go one step more. Lord Chaitanya would say, that's nice, but go further. And he would go one step more. Until Ramananda Roy was at the perfect platform. Even at one point he said, up until this point there has not been a living entity in the universe who ever asked me to go further than this. And then he would go further. So, uh, in this way, it is a bona fide method of spiritual inquiry to just ask, go more, go further, go deeper in a specific way. Uh, tell me more about this subject matter. In this way, one can really advance his consciousness if he is capable. So, uh, the lowest platform was first described, atonement. This modern Mm. system, Christianity, is of the lowest platform of atonement. Therefore, it does not work. And therefore, the whole thing is breaking down quicker than ever before. Because such method of atonement is proven not to work. It just goes on for some time, and then again, it falls down. Yeah. You cannot remain pure. When you're living in a totally materialistic society without any contact with spiritual principles. It is not possible. Therefore, the most important of all principles is associating with devotees. Sadhu Sangha. Associating with devotees is the most important of all principles. One who thinks he can live outside the association of devotees never can actually advance in Krishna consciousness. Must associate with devotees. Devotees are wearing tilak, Ah, who wear the dhoti, you look at them, you see, oh, here's a devotee. Immediately, when you look at him, you see, here's a devotee. But if you look at somebody and he always looks like a materialist, you look at a materialist, you look at that so-called person, devotee, then what is the difference? There's nothing to remind you of Krishna. The dress of a Vaishnava is meant to remind you of Krishna. The Vaishnava is one 
But when you see him, it makes you chant Hare Krishna. You go Hare Krishna. Hare Bol. And when you see a Vaishnava, this is what you do. And the more advanced the Vaishnava is, the more potency there is to make you chant Hare Krishna much. So, <clears throat> we want to <coughs> create a society of people where simply their very presence will purify the atmosphere of a country. Simply their very presence. So that is very difficult. But it requires slow, steady, determined effort. And that means one should follow the sadhana principles of devotional service as properly as possible. Which means rising in the morning, Mangal Artik, chanting the Japa, uh, Guru Puj, Didi greeting, class, Prashadam. Yes, that's also sadhana bhakti. Eating Prashadam is part of the sadhana process, the least painful part. One, But one has to every day eat Prashadam at the time when it's Prashadam time. Not that uh, one will eat ten times a day chocolate bars and and and, 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 and potato chips. He will have a stash in his in his secret compartment and just run in and chomp in it with his head in his locker when no one's looking. Not this. There's prasadam at certain times. One should take. If one has to eat ten times a day, then every day eat ten times a day. In this way, gradually, by the regulation, one's mind will become peaceful. You will no longer be constantly uncontrolled sense reaching out for enjoyment here, reaching out for enjoyment there, without any regulation. Regulation is something which will create a very peaceful atmosphere for a devotee. Sadhana bhakti, very, very wonderful, because even if you're the worst devotee, if you simply follow the sadhana process, you become the best devotee. Some devotees don't require, very few, but some don't require. They are on the Kripa Siddha platform, already purified, already highest platform of devotional service by mercy of higher authorities. Don't expect it. Just perform the sadhana process and gradually, step by step by step, gradually increase in purification, love and devotion. And then all success and devotional service will come. All success. Therefore, we like to work hard for Krishna. We like to follow these principles. We like to associate with devotees because we know this is the way back home. And that's where we want to go. We keep in our mind we want to go back to Godhead. We want to become purified. We want to become Krishna conscious. And then when we act in this way, gradually it will come. There's no doubt about it. So is there any question? Yes. One might forget about it, but you'll remember it again. Because after all, you're only real happy about all this now because the body is young and healthy. And when the body becomes old and decrepit and sick and diseased or smashed, then you'll simply be thinking, when do I get out of this body and go back to God? And now you're in the illusion of thinking everything's nice and wonderful in this body. Therefore, you don't think about it. But don't worry. The material world is so arranged, you'll think of it again. You talk big now. Big words now. We should tape record this. Here's Vishwa Devi on January 14th, 1981, talking big words about how she doesn't care. This is one of the symptoms of youth. We think it will always be like this. So nice. But no... Things get more troublesome. Krishna consciousness is strong enough, but you are not. Therefore, you need this. No, Krishna consciousness is consciousness, it's not you. You're not Krishna consciousness. 
you're a devotee who's trying to be Krishna conscious, but you're not Krishna consciousness. Consciousness is different. Hmm? Where is that cow? Oh, he's right there. I think the cow thinks Turi is in the Bhagavatam class. <laughs> Feed me. Huh? They know. They can smell them. Then. Further on that question, a materialist will say like that because the materialist doesn't want to be purified. Materialists are afraid of purification. Therefore, they're afraid of anything that's related to purification. Therefore, they will say, don't do all of this and then you can still be Krishna conscious, but it's just an excuse. Because what they're really saying is, yeah, let's just stay doing what we're doing now. It doesn't matter. Generally, most things which are right are difficult. That's the way this world is arranged. It's not a difficult process. It's a very easy process. What's difficult is surrendering to it. Just like it's very easy to break the law. Always. It's very easy to cheat on the income tax. It's very easy to break the law. Just like all the time the signs say, don't turn left. Across, and everybody does it. Because it's much easier to break the law than to follow the sign. But if you want to follow all the laws, it's very difficult. And you end up going around 20 blocks and around the circle. And if you just break the law, you go right immediately where you want to go. Many examples like that in this world. Krishna consciousness is like that. You have to surrender to the process. No. (laughs) Actually, your intelligence is not bound by that natural amount of it which manifests through your body. It is not bound like that. The definition of intelligence is the degree to which you can surrender to Krishna. Intelligence is not measured by your technical ability. We sometimes think intelligence means in technical ability. But that is not really intelligence. That's just some knowledge. Intelligence is, uh, of course, from a materialist point of view, just like those people who in, invented the computers and programmed them and do all these fancy electronics, they're very intelligent. But from the Krishna conscious point of view, that is not the qualification of intelligence. The qualification is how much you can surrender to Krishna and how much you realize Krishna. That's actual intelligence. Because intelligence should bring you to the best and most highest goal that you can attain. Therefore, that is not dependent on your material amount of intelligence. Because there are big, big professors who are extremely intelligent, who have no brain whatsoever. That's a fact. And then there are very simple devotees like us who have no material intelligence, what to speak of. Maybe somebody here and there has a little bit. But the most intelligent men, because they know what is the goal of life, they know who they are, they're not crazy men, they know how to act, that is real intelligence. And that can increase unlimitedly, it is not bounded by the material qualities. Therefore, even the most simple devotee can say the most intelligent things and shock a very intelligent man. If you just preach our philosophy, as it is, any really intelligent person will be amazed how intelligent you are. Because if you're reflecting the intelligence of Krishna or the intelligence of your spiritual master, then you'll be known as very intelligent.
่านนะว่าเด้อนั่นแปลว่าเป็นปัจจัยรัฐบาลเยอรมันที่ทำให้ทุกอย่างถูกปล่อยให้เป็นทางเลือกของสังคมและใช้มันเป็นแรงบันดาลใจในสังคมแล้วทุกอย่างถูกปล่อยให้เป็นทางเลือกของสังคมและใช้มันเป็นแรงบันดาลใจในสังคมแล้วทุกอย่างถูกปล่อยให้เป็นทางเลือกของสังคมและใช้มันเป็นแรงบันดาลใจในสังคมแล้วทุกอย่างถูกปล่อยให้เป็นทางเลือกของสังคมและใช้มันเป็นแรงบันดาลใจในสังคมแล้วทุกอย่างถูกปล่อยให้เป็นทาง To get rid of all of those aspects of the society, which create criminals, which create drug addicts, which create this and that, and therefore they make a they make 1984. Don't forget, we're only three years away. By sterilizing the environment, they say now you see these, these things can't it won't happen anymore. Of course, that doesn't work either. But they're using it as an excuse. A criminal is not a criminal because of his environment. A criminal is a criminal because, first of all, of his own modes of material nature. Second of all, his own karma, and third of all, the inability of the government or the leader of the government, who's also a criminal, to stop him. But nobody takes psychology seriously. No, it doesn't. They're still going on with the same thing. No matter what they say, they're doing the same thing all the time, sterilizing everything, making it all so-called equal. They don't. They're just throwing philosophies out, mixing them up, churning them around. But this is the same thing is going on all the time. Psychology is worthless; doesn't change anybody. Psychology is worthless. Modern psychology simply says, "Feel good about what you are and what you're doing." That's all. And what is the use of that? You're an animal. Feel good about being an animal. And then be a good animal. Really get into it. Run around naked and jump up and down. Get into being an animal. This is modern psychology, and modern sociology is. Who even knows what modern sociology? Is? And I don't even think they. I think it died. I think sociology died a couple of years ago. No one's ever heard of it. Is it? Kind of like disappeared. It's all become psychology. Social psychology has taken over. Sociology died. Social psychology took over, and it's becoming psycho sociology. Sociology of psychos. History, history always was dead. Nobody knows what happened previously because of history. They just wrote whatever they felt like writing, and that became history. The reality of those times was totally different. <laughs> It was just a couple of people had certain perceptions, and they called this history. Then later on, they standardized. They just took all the different histories and got rid of this part that wasn't standard and that part that wasn't standard. There you got history. It's a fraud. Modern education is a fraud. Even the educators know it. There are so many books about how it's a fraud. 
so many different understandings how it's all nonsense. But still it goes on because they're making their money that way. Psychology doesn't help anybody except the psychologists. We're making an awful lot of money. This is the modern society. It's a fraud from top to bottom. They're benefiting nobody by anything they're doing. It's unbelievable fraud. We can defend that. And nobody will disagree, really. No learned man will disagree. He will say, well, what's better? There's no better. It's just going on. Oh, what's better? But when they hear, for example, the principles of Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavatam, they include all the psychological principles you need to know for becoming a good human being. It may not be listed in Srimad Bhagavatam, 6 Canto, Part 1, Chapter Psychology, and you read it. No, it's not listed like that. But what is listed is life, real life. And then all of the different aspects of it are woven through. And an intelligent man can dissect what he needs to understand how to live. Whereas this modern psychology, modern everything, it's all sterile. It's totally separated from reality. They try to make experiments, but their experiments are not real. They're artificially induced experiments. Artificial conditions, artificial everything. Where as soon as the observer enters into the field of activity, the whole thing is different. That's one of the latest principles of physics. That the observer's consciousness alters the entire field of activity. That alone makes the whole thing ludicrous. Yes? Huh? What is this? Oh, Shiva Linga. That is representation of Lord Shiva. Just like Shalagam Shila is also sometimes looks like stone. Different representations or different forms. Any other questions? What? Really? Psychologists? <laughs> That's good, they should increase it. <laughs> you should encourage them in this way. Physician, heal thyself, then call yourself a physician. First of all, Outside, generally, nobody has very much intelligence. And inside, it just becomes obvious. <laughs> so instead of, it act, instead of it seeming that actually you're not using your intelligence, it's, it's actually becoming obvious you never had any. One has to learn everything over again. How to how to be intelligent. One has to learn. It's a new process. But you also did that when you were climbing. You studied hard before your test, a week before your test, and then the day after your test, you all of those knowledge went out of the bed. No? 
gifted. And now, well, what can we say? What would you? What was? What is your solution for me? Uh huh. And well, why did it work in the material world? Uh huh. So you're not doing what you want now. What about you? The mind didn't do whatever it wanted in the material world either. No. Your mind actually thought it did whatever it wanted. Never frustrated in any way. I think there's some fantasy. I think there's a... a the sugar plums and the fairies and the a lot of fantasy is here. One should examine whether one is schizophrenic or not. Anyone who thinks that everything was peachy keen, first class, a okay, when he was in the material world, definitely. It was an illusion. <laughs> it was? How can you say a thing like that? What a complete nonsense to say. Mind is working properly. Eating, sleeping, mating, and defending like an animal. And your mind is working properly. You've got this fantasy notion about the former times. How great the mind was and how it was great. Everything was perfect and wonderful. So fantasy. How can you maintain such an idea? But I mean, this is just all, it's all jumbled, you know? First you have to get together. Who's in charge here? Are you in charge or is the mind in charge? Now the mind has always been in charge. Now you've got to put you in charge. And because you're putting you in charge, the mind is now saying, well, I don't work anymore unless I'm in charge. It's like the kid you said, unless I'm the captain of the team, I don't play. So the mind says, unless I'm the captain, I'm not playing anymore. You can go, you can go find another captain. So it takes time. You have to keep booting the mind until he realizes that there's no choice anymore. You have to capture the rascal. Boot, kick, hit. Heavy. You're not doing that. Huh? You have to try, you have to endeavor. When the mind wants to think this or that, you have to force it to think of something else. This means discipline. Undisciplined mind is very flabby and weak. You never get anywhere. You have to force the mind. It's like, how do you learn something? You force. Force it to learn. Learn. Read this. Memorize it. Work at it until you do memorize. After a while, so much pounding of the brain, it'll do it. Thank you. But as long as you have so much respect, so much self-esteem for your mind, how nice it used to be and all that, you never get anywhere. Mind is a, is a <laughs> dog eater. Quote, mind. Dog eating mind. So you pound it into submission. You don't say, oh, I can't learn a verse, or oh, I can't do this, I can't do that. You do it 
forcefully. And then gradually mind will go along. But you will only do what you want to do. And therefore lazy, fat mind, big flabby fat mind sitting up there with all the tubs, what do you call it, the rolls of flesh just pouring over the belt, oozing everywhere. Big flesh. You gotta slice it off. Yes, if you have, if you just have this big tubby up there in your brain, I don't know how to say it. Either. You just have this big flabby brain up there. What is the use? It's got to be get strong. You have to beat it, get the weight out, make it work. You have to make it run, sweat off the flab. That means you have to struggle to do these things properly. Don't just let whatever your mind says or whatever your feelings are, let that manifest as activity. Set a goal and force it to get there. That will make the mind strong. Otherwise, big flabby mind, what is the use of that? Even if it's very big. Better to have a nice trim one. When the mind really has you under control. What are you so happy about that for? <laughs> you should be completely miserable. You're being held captive by a ten-ton flab in your head. <laughs> All right, Hare Krishna.